Welcome to the Pet Loss Companion. I'm Ken Dolan Del Vecchio, and I'm here with my friend and colleague and co-author, Nancy Saxton Lopez. And this is a broadcast that we do live every Thursday at 6 p.m. Eastern time. And then it's available on YouTube and on Facebook for replay and also on a variety of podcast outlets. And we are happy to have you join us live. We're happy to have you listen to or view the program at another time. And please send us your questions, comments, suggestions for for uh, future shows because we rely on them to know what's going to be most helpful for for you. We want to let you know that this program is a friend of Dakin Humane Society in Springfield, Massachusetts. Dakin is a 501c3 community supported animal welfare organization that provides shelter, medical care, spay neuter services and behavioral rehab for more than 20,000 animals and people every year. Since its inception in 1969, Dakin has become one of the most recognized nonprofit organizations in central Massachusetts and a national leader in animal welfare. You can learn more about Dakin and make a donation at dakinhumane.org. That's D A K I N H U M A N E.org. And I will also let you know that I will have the privilege of doing an event it, that is being supported by Dakin on November 16th. It's a Zoom opportunity for me to do some reading from Nancy and my book, The Pet Loss Companion, Healing Advice from Family Therapists Who Lead Pet Loss Groups, and also to facilitate a conversation. So please consider joining me and the group for a live conversation. And hopefully that will be something that, like this broadcast, will reach a number of people and be very helpful. You can reach me at kenddv at gmail.com. And you can reach Nancy at N Saxton Lopez. That's N S A X T O N L O P E Z at C S M P C dot com. We look forward, as I said, to hearing from you and, and getting your questions, comments, and suggestions for future mm -hmm. broadcasts. So we're going to start today with a letter that we got, and it's from a person who works as a veterinarian. And we're going to, I'm going to read this note and then we're going to have a conversation mm -hmm. about many of the points that she raises that are, we think really affirmations of the experiences that many people who lose a pet find themselves going through as well. So this is from Dr. Christy Moding. And she said, and I'm going to read right from the beginning because this is something I forgot to mention. You may use any of this on the podcast or elsewhere if you think it would be helpful. Mm -hmm. If you send us a communication, please let us know whether it's okay to share. We really like to share the comments and questions and letters that people send us because they are so helpful for others to hear. They're so validating. So Christy writes, I lost my dog after 15 years together. His name was Pancake, and he would come to work with me each day and attend all of our vacations as he was a 10-pound Maltipoo who traveled well. I work as a veterinarian, so he would roam the horse farms while I worked and attend the clinic when I was caring for dogs and cats. I've worked as a vet for 11 years, so thought I would be more prepared to lose my friend, but it was very difficult. He had many medical problems, but one Sunday, I couldn't control his pain and elected an in-home euthanasia while my husband held him. Having provided his medical care my entire life, I did not think administering the injection myself would be so traumatic, but it was, and he yelped in the last moment. Mm. I try to remind myself, as I do clients, that this was just one second of the 15 yes. years we had but it is troubling. I have clients that seem to feel extreme guilt for not being there in the final moments. And I hope they all know that we do not judge them and our nurses are kind to their pets during these last moments. We have two young kids, which I thought would help insulate me from grief. While it does force me to conduct business as usual at home in terms of eating, sleeping and exercise, the grief is still devastating. I've attended a local pet grief group, but this wasn't sufficient. I found your book and the podcast you have with Nancy has been immensely helpful to process my grief. 
We buried Pancake in our yard and I've had intrusive thoughts about his body afterwards. And it was helpful to know that these types of things are normal and will become less frequent. I'll be recommending the book and podcast to my clients in need of support. I hope this process makes me a more empathic vet and that I will be able to love another dog again when my heart is a bit more healed. Thank you so much for what you do. It really helps so many people. Yeah, I mean, uh, it, the email she sent was was very tender and loving and and anxiety provoking and um, guilt pr producing. I mean, all of the things that, hey, listen, she's a professional, right? This is what part of what she does. Um, you know, every, maybe a few times a week, maybe every day. I, she may just be in a regular practice that doesn't see death as often. Here in specialty vets see it much more. And so, um, you know, when it came to euthanizing her own animal, it was, of course, she would have those feelings. It's not, yeah. you know, I'm sure she's caring. I mean, when I, you know, working at Blue Pearl and going in with euthanasias with people and, and the veterinarian and the tech would come in and they were so warm and loving and saying, this is how this works. How much time do you need? This is a yes. very difficult procedure and time for you. And they would do it in so, with such compassion but it wasn't their animal, right? So when she had to do it for pancake, you know, obviously she would, all of those feelings because it was her baby would come through like it would for anyone. Well, that that's the thing that, that strikes me is that it, to me, it's so, it's so moving to see that somebody who works as a veterinarian is so human, yeah. <laughs> just as human as the rest of us. And when it's her, beloved family member, it strikes her just the way it strikes any one of us. And, and of course, when she's working with clients, she has to keep or try to keep a certain professional distance as all of the veterinarians who work with our animal companions do. But it comes down to her much loved friend who's been with her for 15 years, years. yeah everywhere <laughs> yeah. Went to work with her it's, every day. It's the same as everyone else and i have to say also one of the things and in my response to to her i said this i was immediately struck by the fact that she says i work as a vet mm -hmm. and not i am a vet and it's to me that's so interesting and and important because it centers her to, the way i read that is it centers her is a human being. A being. Right, exactly. Like she's not a professional. Like I am not a like I I would tend to say I work as a therapist. I work as a health and wellness executive, not I am, because that's not who I am. That's a role I fill. Exactly. And it's important. But so that that immediately struck me as as that that this person, Christy, is somebody who has a very hum, human center, who exactly. kind of who is grounded in a knowledge that, that she is a human being first and everything else that she does, every role that she fills, of course, is important. And I'm sure she does it with great care and concern and proficiency. But that, that was very interesting for me to see right off the bat. Well, also, she talked about worrying that she, or not worrying, she said something about, I hope I have more i hope i have empathy for she already has empathy yeah, no. you know <laughs> you know you can't yeah. do this kind of work without having yeah. some empathy right you love Although some empathy. some veterinarians have such a boundary oh, that's true that just like true. some physicians they're just they not empathy. really they don't they haven't really practiced this the empathy skills the way you would hope that maybe they would right so it is true i think it depends on um, how long they've been in the field, you know, mm -hmm. who they are as a person. Yeah. But, but, you know, in this case, I, I really believe that she had some empathy. Oh, because sure. Said, yeah. She was, she was writing us as a human being. She wasn't writing us as, as, a, as her profession. Yes. Even yeah. though and she and, talked about her role. So it, again, there's so many points, like the fact that he yelped. Yeah. During and that the that's the thing that stays with her or that troubles her 
so many other people have said oh, that kind and of it, thing, like they flinched or they yelped or they did like an agonal ex agonal exhalation. Blood. And, and that is just so, it's so it's driven into like our, the way we remember the, their passing. It's and, traumatic for a lot yeah. of people because and, they will not, inter you know, expect that unless the veterinarian was able to say now she's a vet so she would know yeah. that that could have been a possibility but in but uh, for a lay person you know they would the, unless the vet says these things could happen right you know it would be i mean i've seen people traumatized you know after that I've seen oh that. sure because the body sometimes will will move and there's breathing you know there's breathing going on but there's not really we would assume there's not consciousness anymore you know there's something that looks like breathing or exhalation or or whatever and and again even though this is her field when it's this close to her heart of course it's it makes a huge impact just yes. so no matter how well prepared we may be the way i look at that is it's a it's a lesson for all of us that no matter how well prepared we may be for their passing for the euthanasia it's still, it's, it's still, it still it's may still. tear at us in a way that has unexpected depth, mm -hmm. unexpected power. And the, another thing in her, another point in her note that struck me is how having this very full family life, mm -hmm. <laughs> she's got young children and, you know, she's following through with her routine of, taking care of kids and being a, a partner to her husband and doing her exercise and all. And yeah. still that helps, but it doesn't mean but it doesn't take grieving. the grieving away. Right. It's, it's still, that it's still so you're there. still grieving. You're still like all of that helps because it's a way to it's what I would think of as in, to some extent a constructive distraction from the yes. grief like you're you're going to do what you need to do in life and it's a good thing that your life has a lot of points of focus and responsibilities and, but still that doesn't mean that you're not going through your own journey of, of, of grief and, and there was there was another thing in the beginning too when she obviously as a veterinarian she was she was taking care of pancake herself there were medical yep. issues, right now there are pros and cons when I, she knows exactly what probably what to do as far as those medical things but she also then had to come to that decision to euthanize yeah. knowing that right so um and that's and and even though she knew it still was a hard decision to make yeah of course yeah. um yeah. But, Yep. And it, Even with all of that information, so you again think about when it comes to our own animal companions, how important it is to have consultation, to have yeah. trusted others who help us with the decision, if at all possible. And if we are single, if there aren't, if we don't have a partner, maybe there's dear friends who know our cat or dog or who whoever our animal companion is, or we have the vet who we trust very very much we want to do as we want to use the consultation that's available now the, uh, um something came into my head before you were you were doing the group way in the beginning we had a veterinarian come to the group mm -hmm. and he had i think it was a boxer i believe and he also worked with horses so so he and his dog would go all the time all over to where he was you know seeing the horses or other you know um farm animals that he was taking care of. Unfortunately, um, he the dog developed a perforated bowel and he died. Mm -hmm. Wow. And he was at the group because obviously of the guilt. Here he's a veterinarian and he didn't pick up what happened to his dog, right? So it was agonizing for him. Um, and he was trying to work through that guilt and work through that grieving. Um, and he was very thoughtful, you know, and of course, very sad, but it just also proves that all professionals anywhere, especially in, in this world that we're in, in the, in the animal world, world, are humans. And there's a, there's a, there are limits to what we can know yeah. with yeah. all, of, with all of those skills, with all of that background knowledge as a professional veterinarian, he wasn't omniscient. He couldn't know everything. No. He couldn't see 
every possibility and there is just there's there's great wisdom in that knowledge that there's so much that's way outside our control and and particularly caregiving professionals and people who are extraordinarily conscientious about their loved ones tend to feel even more like I should have seen it coming I should have known I should have I, I should have been aware of the, the signs and we just are we are confronted over and over again oh, in yeah. life and certainly when it comes to the loss of a beloved animal companion oh, or or a, a human being that there there's a lot more outside of our control yeah. than within our sphere of control right. and that's hard it's scary right it's scary when that, when that hits us because we realize that we have an illusion <laughs> we should be in control of a lot more in life than we, we really just, are right. we just aren't yeah. i think that's one of the gifts actually for children in having a, a pet because it helps them to understand that there's a lot of there's a lot that goes on in the world that we just you know is outside of our I'm understanding right. outside of our control we do the best we power. can right it's outside of our power we you know we do the best we can but we're not all powerful we're not all seeing and the other thing that she said that we talked about a little beforehand was her intrusive thoughts about after yes. burying pancake yeah. that something was going to happen to his body, which would be, we talked about this last episode, I think the anxiety that comes out of working through the death, right? Going oh. through the end of life, going and, through years, burying him. And now, oh my God, is, is he going to be okay? Well, imme immediately I thought of when, when Isabel died, and I was there and I was, you know, I was with her for quite a while after she died. And then we, the vet, the vet's team put her in this box and they put a flower on the box. And my husband, Tim was away in Georgia at the time. So I put her in the free, I put her in a freezer that we have, an auxiliary freezer. And all I could think about was what if she wakes up? I know, right. All I can think what happens is, if really what she's I mean, alive? As soon as I read Christie's note, that's what flashed in my head. And right. then I remembered how fresh that was and how that doesn't happen anymore. It has a different, it's sort of a, I can recall it, but it doesn't jar me. Like I literally, when we, because oh, Tim wanted to see her body. And when we opened that up, I was relieved to see that she hadn't moved. I, there was a part of me <laughs> that felt like, what if she was like moving in there? I, I wouldn't, you know, but that's how, that's those intrusive thoughts. That's right. That Christie's yeah. talking about in this letter. And they, they are, the, the images and, the, and, and they do, they do subside. They become less frequent. Yes. They become less, they become less uh, compelling Right. But you can still, I can still, I can I still recall it, can still recall it. So this is a really, this is a really helpful note. I think it's going to be helpful for a lot of people to, to hear that these experiences are so typical and they're so common, even for people who work so close to this, yes. this well, caregiving yes. function right. all the time. And, and the time. I want to emphasize what she said too, because people always are so upset not knowing what the process is not knowing what the euthanasia process is, not knowing what happens behind the doors not yep. being interrupted. and she was very it was so nice to hear her say that i have clients that seem to feel extreme guilt for not being there in the final moments because sometimes they can't um, and i hope they all know that we do not judge them for not being there and our nurses are kind to their pets during their last moments and I think that that's really important for people to hear. Yeah. And, it, and, and again, if you've trusted your vet, you know, oftentimes people will have a longstanding relationship with their veterinarian and with the staff at their veterinary practice. And it's important to just keep trusting, right? To just mm -hmm. trust that they're going to, they're going to take care of your pet just the way they always have. And they're going to be as gentle and supportive as they, as they possibly can be. I mean, that's, that's, great that it was reinforced yes note. and it's you know we do the best we can and if you can't be there 
you, you can't be there. You can't. You just right. can't. Sometimes you can't. So uh, do we, we want to talk some about... Her. Oh, I'm sorry, Nancy. Yeah. We're... No, we, I've got Boogie here. Now, let me tell you something. <laughs> He's 30 pounds, all right? <laughs> so, ugh. So we're going to be talking about bringing a new... <laughs> what, what a great face. What a great face. He's really beautiful. <laughs> He's like, what's going on here? Yeah, you're on TV. <laughs> Um, what a beautiful dog! Yeah, he's 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 a keeper for sure. <laughs> um, but we were going to talk about what happens when you get another pet, and specific, kind of specifically after one dies. And and yeah. whenever you get a pet, it could be. I mean, some people do a day after. It could be never. But most people do go ahead and do that. And so, and it could be a few a few weeks, or it could be you know a couple months, but. What do we do with that? And we just got him a little over a week ago. He's a rescue. He came from Turkey. Um, and so we got him through the French uh, Bulldog Rescue Network. But he is epileptic, mm -hmm. you know, but we had worked with that with Hank for many years. So luckily he has not had a seizure, um, but he's on a lot of meds and so forth. So, but I'll put him down now because he's heavy. He but, is a really, he's a really handsome dog. He's really okay. beautiful. Um, he looks, he looks to, totally like relaxed. Like, oh, he is. He's a chill dog. <laughs> I, I can't even imagine what he went through in Turkey because when the foster family got him, they said he didn't move for two weeks. I mean, he just went out to, to, to the bathroom and he ate and that was it. Wow. Is he so, moving more now? Oh, he's all over the place. And he's very chill. He, he just moved in. He, you know, he wants to play with Jack and Ellie, but he's so much bigger. We have to be careful with that. And, and Jack's 15 and a half, you know. He less, he looks really big. You say he's 30 pounds. Yeah, he's almost 30 pounds. He looks so, more than that, actually. Yeah, he's, he's a big boy. So, um, <laughs> but you know what happened with that? I mean, we, we saw him, you know, we had been, I had been sort of looking. And um, let's and, be honest, you were looking. Yes, I was looking. <laughs> it's like I, mean, I was looking immediately. Yeah, right. <laughs> okay, you know we we do it that way. But um, but I want I was looking at one that was paraplegic, like Ellie, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but she was scuffed up. So that day, I saw him, right? And his name was Noah at the time. And so um, I applied. I thought, okay, can't. You know, it's a it's a process, right? It's 20 mm -hmm. pages and they come out to your house and you have to do interviews, which is fine. And all of a sudden we got him. And I'm like, Whoa. OK, so um, and it was interesting because I had remember we, we did the medium. I did the medium thing. Right. And all the dogs oh, yeah. out and she said to me, are you getting another dog? And I, at the time we were just going through the process and she said, take him. They all say take him because he will be special. And, and it just worked. So that's kind of, you know, interesting. But it, it did bring back all the ones that have died to me, though. Right? Yeah. I started to think about all of my seven babies that, you know, have, have gone before, starting in 1989. And so even though they were, um, they were pugs, um, we just started the, the Frenchie thing with Ellie. It still, they were all of our, you know, our beloved animals, right? And it was really, it was really interesting for me to, to all of a sudden they were all here, right? Kind of in spirit, which is kind of interesting. Yeah. I mean, you know, I've got my new Hildy and we've had her for a few weeks now, maybe three weeks. I'm not really, when did I get her? I can't remember. It seems like we've had her for quite a while and having her is really fun. She's kind of a wild puppy. She's, she's a lot of fun. And it also is the case that I have these moments where I remember all of the dogs. And yeah. I sometimes will, will remember how tiny my, it, she really punctuates, she's, she's about 13 pounds now, 13 or 14 pounds. And that really punctuates how tiny my little chihuahuas were. They were oh, all about five and a half, six pounds. And, and she's playing with their toys, which is really gratifying actually. And I, I actually nice. feel like, this you know, again we've talked about we've talked about this so maybe it won't sound strange but i feel like abigail is very happy that she's mm -hmm. playing with her toys her that toys. he'll be playing with her toys and i actually see abigail 
it with her sometimes. It's very, it's, it's very interesting the way that she's the only one who I see. I feel like all the others have kind of moved on more completely somewhere, but, but it, it does kind of punctuate the difference. Yeah. And I do have some very sad moments, but I also have this new life who I am spending a lot of time. Well, of course, and you're loving, you're loving her, right? I mean, you're starting a new relationship. <laughs> and, at, but it's not, it's not for everybody, right? I mean, you really have to, I, I feel, I felt like when we didn't have a dog, like there was just a, like, I need to have a dog in my life, at least one. And you did, and you needed loud. one. You needed <laughs> one. I was just talking to a friend yesterday and he and his wife have a 14 year old dog and they just adopted another dog because they yeah they're yeah 14 yeah. getting up there you know and, and they're like, saying that the little the little 14 year old who is a little pug you'll oh. be happy to know who is both blind and deaf is totally dominant over this massive <laughs> this massive new dog who totally gives <laughs> gives space like it's absolutely accepting of the hierarchy that this little dog is, in, I mean, dogs have a hierarchy and that's just the way they live. And so that seems to be going really well, but it's very interesting to me, the different styles that people have, because some people like this letter from Christy says, she knows that her heart needs to go through some healing before, before she, she brings a new dog or cat or probably a dog into her life. Whereas for me and for you, it seems like I, 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 I'm at a loss <laughs> without having a dog. <laughs> I know. With this dog. I mean, well, and you have multiple, we've had multiple, you know, types of, of pets, but, you know, but the other interesting thing was I looked this up and this is very quick, but it was a veterinarian. I was just talking to you about, to, to you about it. And um, he said that he experienced, um, this was about when you get a dog and how that works another dog. He, um, I experienced something else many years ago after Woody, his lab passed and we brought, we brought home Theo, another black lab, our third one. Besides being adorable, we noticed so many qualities that Theo often displayed that reminded us so much of Woody. Actually, Theo got us thinking more about Thor and Woody than we probably ever would have without him. It was then I realized that the best way to memorialize a lost pet is through a new one. This is his veterinarian saying this. The new pet will inevitably exhibit some behavior quirk or expression that will immediately remind you of your past pets and bring that huge smile back to your face. Well, yeah, and, and it's such a testament to having loved before to say, I'm going to share my home again. And but but it is really important, I think, to recognize that we we can be very different. I, I know yes. a few people who say I could never do it again. Could it never, right. Too, there were it many was just too painful. Yeah. It was too heartbreaking. I, I just can't do it. And so we, it's important to be respectful of all the different ways all that different loss choices, touches right. us right. Right. and that loss changes us mm -hmm. and, and to be okay with that in ourselves and, and, and in others, others because and, and again, there's no right or wrong. I mean, the, the one thing that, that I think that it's important to think about is that if, you're, if you have any, if you think maybe it's too soon, it can never hurt to give yourself more time. Exactly. That's, that's the one caveat, I think. Like you should never rush in because the, you feel impulsive about it or you feel like that somehow getting the new one is going to, Make it so you don't have to grieve. That doesn't work. It doesn't work. That doesn't work. There's and also that's one thing. There's also we would tell people in the group. Remember, you can't replace the one that's died with no. another dog, or or and some people get a cat and they get a different type of animal, right? Yeah. But you can't replace the one that's died. A lot of people would get the same breed and name it the same name. Yeah. And that unfortunately would be can, can get complicated for them, you know, because if you got a if you had an elderly dog that died and then you got a puppy, it's a whole different ballgame. Oh yes. 
Yeah. So it's just that, you know, you can't replace the person, the dog or a cat. or No, the one, one soul, one soul is, one soul. is unique. There are, right. Every one of us is unique and every one of them is unique. That's but right. if you can bring another one in and love them and take care of them and it feels right, then it makes sense to, to do it and recognize that you're still going to have your, your journey of grief yeah. and you're still going to go through whatever you need to go through to find the way to hang on to the, the love and the memories that you had in that previous relationship or those previous relationships. And remember that that animal only has you that you are their life, but we can have many. Yeah. yeah. I love that saying. Yeah. So that's, that's a wonderful note to end on Nancy As always. It's been a great conversation. I, I congratulate you on your new family member. He is quite something. I like his collar too. It's very fetching. (laughs) (laughs) And we'll talk again next week then. Next week. Everyone take care and thank you, Christy. Yeah. Thank you again, Christy.